Good morning, church. Please open your Bibles or you can follow along in the bulletin. Today's scripture reading comes from the book of Acts, chapter 1, verses 15 through 26. I will be reading from the Christian Standard Bible Translation, Acts, chapter 1, verses 15 through 26. In those days, Peter stood up among the brothers and sisters. The number of people who were together was about 120 and said, Brothers and sisters, it was necessary that the scripture be fulfilled, that the Holy Spirit, through the mouth of David, foretold about Judas, who became a guide to those who arrested Jesus. For he was one of our number and shared in this ministry. Now this man acquired a field with his unrighteous wages. He fell head first, his body burst open, and his intestines spilled out. This became known to all the residents of Jerusalem, so that in their own language, that field is called Hakeldama, that is, field of blood. For it is written in the book of Psalms, Let his dwelling become desolate, let no one live in it, and let someone else take his position. Therefore, from among the men who have accompanied us during the whole time, the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John until the day he was taken up from us. From among these, it is necessary that one become a witness with us of his resurrection. So they proposed two, Joseph called Barsabbas, who is also known as Justice, and Matthias. Then they prayed, You, Lord, know everyone's hearts. Show which of these two you have chosen to take the place in this apostolic ministry the Judas left to go where he belongs. Then they cast lots for them, and the lot fell to Matthias, and he was added to the eleven apostles. This is the word of the Lord. Good morning, Redeemer Fellowship of Kuwait. Uh, my name is uh, Morgan Renu. I'm a pastor uh, at Redeemer Church of Dubai, and it's a great joy to be here. Uh, Redeemer Dubai, uh, send their greetings, uh, send their love to you. Uh, Redeemer are so thankful for the partnership in the gospel that we have. Uh, they are thankful for you. They are praying for you. And it's a special joy for me to, uh, to be here, to enjoy church, worship with you, and to be invited to uh, just step into your series in, in the book of Acts and to, uh, to preach this part of God's word. It really is a privilege to, uh, to be here. Uh, this is, uh, I think, an interesting part of God's word, um, yet I'm excited. I think it gives us great uh, hope as we seek to serve our Lord Jesus. Uh, so let's pray that God would speak to us, that he would build us up, that he would give us hope through his word. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much uh, that you speak to us. Uh, thank you that in your word we see your glory, yet we also see the realities, the fallen realities of this world and of life. Today, would you help us to see you clearly in your word? Help us to grasp how you even then were working out your purposes. And so give us confidence, give us hope, even draw us in to what you are doing in this world. Father, it's in Jesus' great and good name that we pray. Amen. Well, many years ago, I was uh, planning a holiday with my family. I was living and pastoring in Sydney, Australia, uh, my, my hometown. Uh, and we had a holiday planned up in Brisbane, about a thousand kilometers away. Uh, my wife and my, a couple of my kids were going to fly up, which took one hour. Uh, but so we had a car there. I was going to, at the same time, drive the, the 10 hours to get up to Brisbane. And before this long holiday, I had one last meeting to do at church. And so I did that uh, late the night beforehand. Uh, which I now realize was a big mistake because that meeting did not go well. Uh, the meeting did not go well and I started my holiday and this long, lonely drive in the shadow of failure. I was wondering, even weeping, why were God's people so angry? Why does our church seem so divided? Have I done something wrong? Have I failed in leadership? Or, or are they being unfair? Or 
they're in the shadow of failure. I was wondering, what do I do next? What do I do now? I feel like I've been trying to do the right thing. I wonder if you ever felt like that. A friend you've been talking to, showing maybe some interest in the gospel, think they might come along, they might come along, and then again, they, they called you maybe last night and said, sorry, no, I'm not interested anymore. What do you do the next day? How do you keep going? You might have been fighting sin, yet again fallen into that old sin that you can't seem to shake. The next morning, what do you do? How do you keep moving in the shadow of failure? You might have heroes, a megachurch pastor that you've listened to, profited from, from around the world. And when you hear of stories, failures in the church, how do you keep going in the shadow of failure? I think this word, this a part of the book of Acts, we see one of the great apparent failures. Uh, we're in the shadow of the failure of Judas. In this part of Acts, we're really under two shadows. There is the shadow of Jesus' great victory. Jesus is alive. He's defeated death. At the shadow of Jesus' great command, you, he said to the remaining apostles, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. In the shadow of Jesus' victory, Jesus' great commission, yet the next morning they have to do this commission and, it's, well, it's awkward, isn't it? Because one of those who should have been a witness had betrayed the Lord Jesus. One of those who should have been among these witnesses it was a traitor and now was dead. So what do they do next? This even, I imagine, would be a challenge for Peter. Peter had been told that he would be a leader among the apostles. Uh, he himself had failed. He, he was still probably living in the shadow of some of his failure. He'd been recommissioned by the Lord Jesus. Yet this is the first time we really see him step up to take this mantle of leadership, this side of the resurrection, this side of his failure and forgiveness and recommissioning. Many times in the book of Acts, Peter will stand up, speak, and wonderful things will happen. But the first time that Peter stands up to speak, it is awkward matter of replacing Judas. But today we'll see... What happened on that day? How the church continued in the shadow of failure. And we'll, we'll see that in the shadow of failure that Jesus' plan remains, Jesus' command remains, and Jesus' power remains. Jesus' plan remains, Jesus' command remains, and Jesus' power remains. We'll start in verse 15 to 20. And we see Jesus' plan remains. Because Judas' betrayal was his responsibility, his wicked act, yet a part of God's plan. Verse 15, In those days Peter stood up among the brothers. The company of persons was in all about 120 and said, Brothers, the scripture had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit spoke beforehand by the mouth of David concerning Judas, who became a guide to those who arrested Jesus. For he was numbered among us and was allotted his share in this ministry. He's reflecting on this, this great tragedy that one of those who'd been numbered among them, one of those whom Jesus had prayed and then chosen, one of these had betrayed the Lord Jesus. He'd been instrumental in the Lord Jesus going to his death. He was numbered among us. But how do, does Peter make sense of this all? Well, Peter goes to God's word. Notice that when Peter wants to make, make sense of it all, he goes to God's word. He goes to the scriptures. At that time, it would have been the Old Testament scriptures. But he said, brother, the scripture had to be fulfilled. To even here, you see uh, the apostle Peter at his confidence in God's word. He speaks of the scripture. 
which the Holy Spirit spoke by the mouth of David. There's a little theology of Scripture there along the way. Uh, The Scripture, God's Word, it's spoken by God, even though he used human authors like David and later like Peter and Paul and Luke. Peter makes sense of this uh, with the Scriptures. And the first thing he says is this Scripture had to be fulfilled And that word fulfillment is important for Luke, the author of Luke's gospel and the book of Acts. Uh, Luke's gospel, the first of these books, uh, he began like this. He said, many have undertaken to compile a narrative of things that have been accomplished or fulfilled among us. Luke, the writer of Luke and Acts. He saw the whole ministry of Jesus, the whole coming of Jesus as not something completely new, but as the fulfillment of many of God's promises, as the culmination of what God had been working together through centuries, through even millennia. Fulfillment is important in Luke, but there's a special word here as he says, brothers, the scripture had to be fulfilled. And this word had to be fulfilled or must be fulfilled, that's a special word throughout Luke's gospel and Acts. This word, must, just one little Greek word, day, but it comes up at key points right throughout the story of Jesus uh, in his earthly ministry um, and now. Listen to some of the time that Luke has used this word, must. In Luke 2, 49, he said, Jesus said to them, why were you looking for me? This is the boy Jesus in the temple. Did you not know that I must be in my father's house? 4 verse 43, Jesus said to them, I must preach the good news of the kingdom of God to the other towns as well, for I was sent for this purpose. This word must is used, it's because this is important. This is the fulfillment of all what all of history has been working towards. Jesus must preach the good news. 9.22, the son of man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and chief priests and be killed and on the third day raised. 1333, nevertheless, I must go on my way today and tomorrow and the day following. It cannot be that a prophet should perish away from Jerusalem. 1725, first, the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by this generation. You see, when this word must is used, it's because this is key to accomplishing God's purposes in history. A part of that is saving sinners. In 19 verse 5 of Luke's gospel, when Jesus came to the place, he looked down at Zacchaeus and said, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for I must stay at your house today. Jesus is so driven to to save sinners. 21 verse 9, when you hear of wars and tumults, do not be terrified. These things must first take place. At the end will not be at once. 22 verse 37 i tell you that the scriptures must be fulfilled about me and he was numbered with the transgressors for what is written about me has its fulfillment and 24 verse 5 and 7 the man on the emmaus road said uh, the men sorry the angels about jesus tomb said why do you seek the living among the dead he's not here he's risen Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and on the third day rise. And then on the Emmaus Road, the risen Jesus says to the men, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. See, where this word must is used is because something big is happening. This is what all of history has been working towards. So here, as Peter says, the scripture had to be fulfilled. The scripture must be fulfilled that Jesus would be betrayed. He's speaking to all of those doubts. What went wrong? Was God's plan derailed? Was God's plan ruined? Did God's plan hit a speed bump? Well, no. This had to happen. This was a part of God's plan 
God's plan. Jesus' plan remains. That's the first thing we, we hear, even the shadow of this great failure, this great tragedy. The saying that this is a part of God's unfolding plan. Nothing has gotten in the way. Nothing, there is no plan B. We see then that Judas' betrayal that led to his judgment. Now here we get a break in, in Peter's speech and we get a little explanation from Luke, the author. Verse 18, now this man Judas acquired a field with the reward of his wickedness and falling headlong, he burst open in the middle and all his bowels gushed out and it became known to all the inhabitants of Jerusalem so that the field was called in their own language, uh, Akeldama, that is field of blood. Here we're reminded that while this was a part of God's plan, that there were great consequences for Judas. Uh, where we're told that this was reward of his wickedness. And here we get some of the mystery of how God's sovereignty and human responsibility. God's, while God is at work, while God is accomplishing his great plans, and they cannot be thwarted, and even evil cannot thwart them, he still holds evil to account. There's still this in, in every one of us, a, a guilt. Here we're told that Judas was wicked, the reward of his wickedness. And we see that the consequences as he even in grief, in guilt, we're not sure, but as he took his own life. Now, there's another account of, of this in Matthew 27, verse 3 to 10. Um, and some might wonder, well, it looks a little bit different there. Here it sounds like um, he fell headlong and his bowels gushed out. In uh, Matthew, it said that he hung himself. Here it says that uh, he acquired a field. In the other one, it sounds like the priests had bought the field, but I think they can, they can be easily held together. Uh, the priests uh, may have bought the field in Judas' name or bought it from Judas' uh, descendants after Judas had died. And, and, and understanding exactly how he took his own life. It could be that the rope snapped and after he killed himself, he, he fell. But again, these, these accounts work together. But here we see that Judas, uh, Judas' wickedness was his own. Judas' wickedness continued. But God's plan was not derailed. And Peter uh, to, to show this, he looks, as we said, to God's word. Peter makes sense of all of this by looking to God's word. Verse 20, it's written in the book of the Psalms. And, and he quotes from uh, Psalm 69 and uh, Psalm 109. But even there in the Psalms, Peter must have been thinking this, this should be no surprise. Psalm 41 verse 9, a psalm of God's King, the Messiah, says, Even my close friend in whom I trusted, who ate my bread, has lifted his heel against me. But you, O Lord, be gracious to me. Raise me up that I may repay them. He says that Judah's judgment was foretold. In the book of Psalms, it's written in the book of Psalms, May his camp be desolate. Let there be no one to dwell in it. In Psalm 69 is a psalm of God's King. Originally written by God's King David, are uh, talking about evil do doers, talking to those who are opposing God and His purposes. But Psalm 69 says, "They gave me poison for food; for my thirst, they gave me sour wine to drink. Let their own table before them become a snare. When they're at peace, let it become a trap. Let their eyes be darkened so they cannot see. Make their loins tremble continually. Pour out your indignation upon them. Let your burning anger overtake them." May their camp be a desolation. Let no one dwell in their tents. Peter is saying we could see it here in God's word. Even this great tragedy, even this great failure, this great defection, it was told in God's word. But if you keep reading Psalm 69, you even get a hint that while Judas had betrayed Jesus, that it was a part of God's plan. Uh, in, in Psalm 69, verse 25, it says, They persecute him who you have struck down. They recount the pain of those you have wounded. 
This psalm is saying, God, I know that you were punishing me. God, I know that you were, you were doing something to discipline me. Yet these evildoers have come along and heaped evil upon evil. And even though it was God's purpose, God's plan at that point, disciplining King David. Here we see it was the Lord's intention that Jesus go to his death. It was the Lord's intention that Jesus die for the sins of the world. Yet as Judas came along this in his own wickedness, in his own greed, that he was held accountable. The second quote is from Psalm 109, that Judas' replacement was also foretold. Uh, Peter says, let another take his office. Speaking from Psalm 109, do not be silent, O God of my praise, for wicked and deceitful mouths are opened against me. Attack me without cause. In return for my love, they accuse me. When he's tried, let him come forth guilty. Let his prayer be counted as sin. May his days be few. May another take his office. Through all of this, could you see that Peter is saying that Jesus' plan remains? This is a great tragedy, a great failure that one of Jesus' close friends, his close followers who'd sat at his feet and heard his teaching, who'd been chosen by him, would turn away. He said, Jesus' plan stands. God's word has not failed. God's plan has not failed. This had to happen. It must happen. Because this is the plan that God has been working toward for all of history. That his son would be betrayed and die for the sins of the world to rise again. Jesus' plan remains. But second, we see that Jesus' command remains. In the shadow of failure, we're to do the next right thing to obey Jesus' command. Uh, being from, from Australia, Sydney, many people uh, ask me my favourite Australian movie, and it's not Crocodile Dundee. Uh, it's actually Finding Nemo. Anyone like Finding Nemo? <laughs> I've got, four, I've got four kids, so I've spent a fair bit of time there. And one of the best lies in all of Fighting Nemo is just keep swimming. <laughs> just keep swimming. That's what they need to do. Uh, another movie that I've been subjected to many times with uh, four young children is Frozen and Frozen 2. And you know, Frozen 2, there's a similar line, a catchy line, just do the next right thing. But even in, in hard times, continuing to know, well, I might not know the whole plan, but how can I just keep swimming? How can I just do the next right thing? And here in the shadow of failure, here's a, here as they reflect on the, the mystery of how God's plan was accomplished through Judas' betrayal. Well, Peter, the apostles, God's people, well, they ask, well, what's next? And they look to Jesus' word, to God's word. They say, well, the next thing is well, to do the next right thing, uh, to uh, obey Jesus' commands. In verse 7, uh, that you would have heard from last week, Jesus had said to his followers, it's not for you to know the times or seasons the Father's fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. This was Jesus' command. Uh, Jesus had told them, go, be my witnesses, share what you have seen in my life and my death and my resurrection. He sent out witnesses. But now they didn't have the full 12 witnesses. They only had 11 witnesses. So when they looked to God's word, well, what they need to do is clear. They need to do what is necessary to obey Jesus' command. So verse 21, So one of the men who have accompanied us during all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John until the day when he was taken up from us, one of these men must become with us a witness to his resurrection. 
Here we see there's a very specific qualification for someone who would be counted as an apostle, as a witness. They needed to be a witness of all of Jesus' public ministry. They also need to be a witness to his resurrection. It needs to be a twelfth, uh, particularly because the twelve apostles were sent there particularly as the twelve to the people of Israel, uh, to the Jews. Uh, we do know that later on we'd get the apostle Paul. And Paul's slightly different. He was an apostle. He was a proper apostle, yet even he says he was an apostle untimely born. He wasn't a witness of all of Jesus' ministry. Uh, Yet he wasn't one of those apostles to the twelve, to the Jews. Uh, He was an apostle to the Gentiles. He was qualified as a witness of the resurrected Christ and who received a direct commission from him. But here we see the apostles, especially these first twelve, had the very specific need. If they were going to be witnesses of Jesus' life and ministry and words, and resurrection were needed to be one of these. So Jesus has given them their command, so what they must do is, is obvious. But did you notice uh, another word in here, the word that I've made a big deal of today? One of these men must become with us a witness to his resurrection. They hear this same word, must. And actually in the sentence, in the Greek, it's actually the first word. So there. At the beginning of verse 21, so one of the men, the whole sentence begins with must. Because they're saying it is so sure what we need to do. We have no option but to obey God's word. If it is God's plan that his witnesses be sent out, if it is Jesus' command that witnesses must be sent out, then we must do this. We must do the next right thing to obey this scripture. I love this determination from the apostles that if Jesus has commanded it, then we must do whatever is necessary to achieve it. Sometimes we can study God's word and ponder it and discuss it and argue about it and appreciate it, but then say, oh, I wonder, should I do anything about this? We sometimes miss that urgency. If Jesus commanded something, I must do it. If Jesus said something, I must believe it. Here they say, well, Jesus has commanded us to go out as witnesses, so we must find a twelfth proper witness. And they do. But again, this is a good reminder as we think back to those ways that we might feel the shadow of failure. The shadow of failure... Do the next right things to obey Jesus' command. Submit to his words. What do you do when that that Bible study you started is kind of petered out and closed down? You do the next right thing. You find a way to keep gathering with God's people. When that friends let you down, what do you do next? Well, look to Jesus' word. How can you love them? How can you keep praying for them? There's something that God's word would have you speak to them. If you've fallen into sin again, don't run from God and his people. Run to him. If you've fallen into sin, church is the place to be. Walk in the light where sin loses its power. If you've got that friend who seem to be showing interest, but has now lost all the interest, or who has walked away. Well, don't give up. Jesus told you to live as his witness. Jesus has sent you out to make disciples. So keep speaking, keep looking for opportunities to give a reason for the hope that you have. Even in the shadow of failure, when you're wondering what went wrong, how did that go wrong? We'll look to Jesus' word and do the next right thing in submission to it. See that Jesus' plan remains, Jesus' command remains, but third, Jesus' power remains. Because we see here that the risen Lord Jesus continues to reign and work 
in power. Now, have you ever been disappointed by a movie sequel? Uh, I have. There's some notable ones for me. Jurassic Park 2 kind of got better after that, but Jurassic Park 2 was missing the main character, Sam Neill. I went to see Jurassic Park 2, but it wasn't really Jurassic Park because the main character wasn't there. It was a disappointment. I, I saw the other day that there was a kindergarten cop too as well. And I'd never heard of that, probably because, well, Arnold Schwarzenegger wasn't in it. And so uh, why would anyone know about it? But we know Axe is like part two of, of Luke's work. Uh, part one is Jesus talked about it, all, that Jesus, uh, all that Jesus had done in his earthly ministry. Uh, at the beginning of Acts chapter one, we're told that, well, in my first book, I, I spoke of all that Jesus began to do and teach. So we're expecting that Acts will now be about what Jesus is continuing to do and teach. Yet some people might think, oh, wait, but where's Jesus? Luke was properly about, about Jesus, but Acts now seems to, well, even gets called in our Bibles sometimes, the Acts of the Apostles. Is this the story of the early church or the story of the Apostles? Well, no, this is a legitimate sequel in that it's still the story of Jesus. We saw what Jesus did and taught in his earthly ministry in Luke's gospel. Acts will continue to be what the risen Lord Jesus continues to do, what the risen Lord Jesus continues to teach. Now that he is, he is raised to the right hand of God, now that he is working out his purposes as Lord powerfully by his spirit through his church. And here we, we get a glimpse, even a little glimpse, into how Jesus, the risen Lord Jesus, continues to reign and work in power. In 123, they put forward to Joseph, called Barsabbas, who was also called Justice, and Matthias. And they prayed and said, You, Lord, who know the hearts of all, show which one from these two you've chosen to take the place in the ministry and apostleship from which Judas turned aside to go to his own place. I love here that they still talk about Judas. It's not this kind of, hush, we can't mention his name. Yeah, it's awkward. Yeah, this was a great failure. Uh, when you're talking about like doing the installation of the next apostles to kind of talk about the failed apostle, that's awkward. But you don't need to pretend that there is no failure. You don't need to pretend because uh, Jesus' work is not threatened by that. They still talk about Judas. Notice here uh, how, they, how they pray. I think there's good reason to believe that while prayer is normally to the Father, through the, the Lord Jesus, through the Son, uh, that at this time they actually pray to Jesus. They pray and say, You, Lord, who know the hearts of all, show which one of these two you have chosen. The language there is just like when Jesus, back in Luke's gospel, Jesus had gone and prayed and then he had come and chosen, same word, uh, his, his disciples. But here, look how they speak of Jesus. You want evidence Jesus is God. Well, they, they call him Lord. Uh, the name that had been reserved for all of history for the creator of heavens and the earth. They say, you know the hearts of all. And throughout the Old Testament, we hear many times that, well, God is the one who knows the hearts of all. Now they say the risen Lord Jesus is the Lord, the one who knows the hearts of all. And then they say, show which one from these two you have chosen. Jesus, in his earthly ministry, had prayed, and chosen. He said, Lord, do it again. Show whom you have chosen. They assume he already has chosen to take the place in this ministry and apostleship from which Judas turned aside. And uh, we're told that if they do this, then they cast lots. How they expect that God will speak to them, that Jesus would answer this prayer? Verse 26, they cast lots for them. And the lot fell on Matthias, and he was numbered with the eleven apostles. 
Now, uh, this is a strange way of discerning God's word for, or to us, uh, God's will to us, that they cast these lots and it seemed to somehow point to Matthias uh, rather than the other. And, but this is another example of how they're looking to Jesus as, well, the Lord, God. Proverbs 16.33 says, The lot is cast into the lap, but it's every decision is from the Lord. Like we might roll the dice, but the Lord in his sovereignty, the Lord who, whose plan rules over all, he knows what, what will show up. And throughout the Old Testament, uh, well, casting lots was used uh, at several points. And at this point, the Lord Jesus answers. They prayed and the Lord who continues to rule, well, in this way, he does answer. Uh, in this way, the Lord shows that he continues to reign in power, that his power remains. That just as he was intimately involved there, praying, choosing, calling his disciples a few years earlier, now that he's sitting at the right hand of God, he's still intimately involved in providing for his church, caring for his church, choosing leaders for his church. At this point, he answered through casting of lots. Yet I don't think this is how God expects us to discern his will today. Because while the casting of lots had happened throughout the Old Testament, and we see it here, what happens a few verses into past this, as we get to Acts chapter 2, well, the Holy Spirit descends. And after the Holy Spirit descends, we never hear again in the Bible of the casting of lots. I think that's because uh, God may have revealed his will at times before the coming of the Spirit in this way. Now he's given us his word, his word in its fullness. Now the Lord Jesus has come. Now he has given us his Spirit so that we might understand his word, so that we might apply it in wisdom. Now we are being transformed by the renewing of our minds, by his word and his Spirit. So what need have we for lots or dice or anything else like that? The Lord Jesus continues to guide us, but now we have his spirit. Now we have his word. We don't need those other things. Actually, how they seek the Lord's will here for what to do next, even though they do end up casting lots, most of what they've been doing is searching the scriptures. What do we do next now that Judas has failed? Peter opened the scriptures and said, what did God say would happen next? What did God say must happen? So as we seek the Lord's wisdom, as we seek the Lord's guidance, we now have his word, even in more fullness than Peter had it. We have his spirit poured out on every one of us. Our minds, we're being transformed by the renewing of our minds. So as we seek his will in different understandings, in different, in different situations, in different trouble, in different dis disappointments, you can say, what would Jesus have me do? What has Jesus commanded? What, has God, what would, does God's word say about what must happen? We see... Jesus continues to reign. Jesus' power remains. And this is a reminder, even the beginning of Acts, and we'll see it in many times, you'll see it in many times in the coming weeks, that the risen Lord Jesus is not distant. He is intimately at work. He, as he promised Peter, is building his church and the gates of hell will not overcome it. You'll see this throughout the book of Acts. That the Lord Jesus remains involved. That he is building his church. Doing it by his word, his spirit, and his people. So we need to remember. As we seek to grow for Jesus. As we seek to live as witnesses. As we seek to take the gospel out. As we get the privilege of being a part of building his church but jesus the one who's building it he's no more remote than he was there on this morning 
The gospel is still his power for the salvation of all who believe. Even if the gospel might seem to be out of fashion amongst the world, the gospel is his power for the salvation of all who believe. Jesus is still building his church. Jesus is still saving people from their sins. Jesus is still transforming lives by the power of his word and his spirit among his people. So friends, we see in all of this, we see in all of this that even in the shadow of failure, Jesus' plan remains. There's no, no plan B. Jesus, God is working out his purpose to build his church, to draw his people to himself. That Jesus' Jesus command remains. That in, in good times and in bad times, we need to look to God and his word Say, what would he have us do? What does he command us to do? Because that is the next right thing to do. Even if we feel like, but it didn't seem to work last time, or it kind of went wrong last time, God's word remains. Let's keep going back to his word. It sets our agenda. It guides us. Finally, Jesus' power remains. We are not alone. You are not alone. Jesus is building his church. Jesus drawing sinners to, to himself. If you're a parent, Jesus is at work in your family and with your children. If you love and are seeking to reach out to a friend or neighbor or colleague, Jesus loved them. Friends, disappointments will come, failure will come, discouragements will come. But Jesus' plan remains. You can take the lead from God's promises. In good times, in bad times, you can wonder what's next. You can look to God's word. What should we always be doing? We should always be growing in godliness. Later on, the apostle Peter would write in 2 Peter chapter 1, This very reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue, virtue with knowledge, knowledge with self-control, self-control with steadfastness, steadfastness with godliness, godliness with brotherly affection, brotherly affection with love. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they'll keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Hey, we want to be effective and fruitful for Jesus, don't we? We want to make an impact for Jesus. But sometimes we feel like, oh, it's hard. How can I do that here? Or how can I do that in this situation? How can I do it in this workplace or in this family? But here at the plan, the plan he says, just keep growing in godliness. A little bit, day by day, every day. See how you can grow in more, more godly. Just add a little bit more love or self-control. If you keep growing in godliness, then he says you will be effective. Might not feel like you're in a strategic place. You might feel trapped. But if you keep growing day by day in godliness, here is his, the plan, the promise of God that you'll be kept from being ineffective or unfruitful in your knowledge of the Lord Jesus. Friends, we need to look back to God's word, God's command. Jesus has told us, make disciples. So friends, keep growing in godliness. Friends, keep making disciples, reaching out. That's his command to us, but it's also his promise. On the Emmaus Road, when Jesus spoke one of those musts, he said to them, these are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures and said to them, Thus it's written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead and that repentance for the forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You see, Jesus laying out his plan and saying, as surely as Jesus needed to die and rise again, the gospel must be preached to all nations. As surely as Jesus would die and rise again, the gospel will reach all nations. So we have Jesus' command to us, yet also his great promise that he is building his church. The gospel will be proclaimed to all nations. 
The book of Revelation tells us that there will be people on that final day from every tribe, language, people, and tongue. So confident of God's word, of God's plan. Continue to submit to God's word in obedience, even in the shadow of failure. But Jesus' plan stands.